so thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's all too easy to disengage in this time of COVID, and I I, I really appreciate the 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 attention. Uh, secondarily, I apologize in advance for not having an, an English accent. If you expected me to uh, to uh, to have it because of the time that I spent in the UK, I do not. I am actually originally American, and I apologize again because uh, I, when I wrote the talk, I wrote it last night, and like many of you, I was uh, a little bit distracted by what's going on in the U.S. right now. Um, and thank you, Michigan, for 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 doing your part in making things a little bit better, uh, possibly, hopefully, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, also, I put together way too much information, uh, you know, based on the uh, based on the the abstract that I put together, clearly uh, what, what's going to happen in this talk is that it's going to sort of float on the surface, surface of things. So, uh, you know, relative to say, for instance, some of the statistics seminars that I used to give and go to at Columbia and still go to and give here at UC, uh, I decided I would actually just come in as a machine learning person and sort of give you a, a, a view of, of a, a body of work instead of going into super hyper technical detail, which is you know boring anyway. You all are smart enough to go off and read the papers if you want to, but I wanted to sort of give you a picture of how everything fits together in what we're doing and sort of what we're aiming to do. So, uh, and again, yes, please, there's only 17 of you on the line. I'm used to having many, or 19, 20 now, I guess. I'm used to having many, many more in my, in my courses. I, I'm okay at reading the chat channel, so if you want to type questions in there or just interrupt anytime. Uh, I think I have an hour. Is that right? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. I have like three hours of material, so we'll just get as far as we can we can get, and you know, we'll we'll go like that. Okay. So it's probably going to be pretty fast. <clears throat> so uh, I'm kind of one of the probabilistic programming people. That's kind of what I'm what, what I'm known for. I don't know how many of you know probabilistic programming, but if if you don't. Uh, it's a, an emerging or emerged field at the intersection of machine learning, statistics, statistics, programming languages, and AI. And in a nutshell, basically what it's about is, you know, if you know deep learning, everybody knows deep learning at this point, you have some sort of uh, uh, program or, or um, excuse me, I, I usually have to lecture with uh, um, uh, uh, power, uh, power, this keynote, so it's all new for me. <coughs> um, in, uh, in, in deep learning, you have some sort of neural network. It's a nonlinear function approximator of some, of some kind. You take some sort of input, maybe a picture, and it, it produces some output. You run the thing in this direction, and you go off and you train parameters of this neural network using supervised data. Statistics, we have some sort, of, some sort of data that we'd like to analyze. It's out there. These are observations. Generally, generally, I, I, I screwed up and didn't change two slides. Generally, I'm going to use y for observations and x for latent variables. Okay. And then theta and phi for parameters throughout. But anyway, in statistics, you really have some observation y, uh, and then you build some sort of a model and you do some kind of inference. Generally, we're going to be talking about Bayesian inference in this talk. Hopefully, that's not offensive. Uh, I don't know the, the, the culture at the University of Michigan, but we're going to talk about Bayesian inference, not frequent basic inference throughout uh, most of the talk today. So, what we're, what we're after is characterizing some sort of posterior distribution over the latent variables of some model that we specify. Uh, given some observations why. Okay. So probabilistic programming uh, is about basically doing Bayesian statistics using the using the tools of computer science. So uh, the, the 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 model family that we're going to consider are models that we can denote in computer language. Out the outputs of those of executing those programs are going to be the observations that we get. And instead of running the program, whatever it happens to be a neural net or a simulator or something in between, and we're going to talk a lot about a combination of these two today, what we'd like to do is instead of running the program forward, we'd like to run the program backwards in some sense. We want to do, do inference about the inputs or, or latent variables of the program uh, given, given its output. Okay. So in terms of like me telling you what probabilistic programming is and, and why I'm interested in it, I can just summarize it in a couple of Brief slides, and this is a TLDR that you can you can you can take away, I suppose. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in so I'll just read this. You can read it yourself. But the gradient operator of languages that support automatic differentiation is to deep learning. So you know we've got PyTorch and TensorFlow and all sorts of things like that, and JAX and whatever. And you have the gradient operator, which allows you to get the gradient of some some function with respect to its its uh, input parameters. Uh, <clears throat> the gradient 
that supports automatic differentiation is to deep learning as the conditioning operator of languages that support automated inference is to pro probabilistic programming. So really, probabilistic programming is about uh, is a, is is about uh, conditioning. Okay, and there are and in the introduction of operators that allow you to condition. So languages for deep learning allow specifying and automatically solving forward function and function approximation problems via optimization. Probabilistic programming languages allow specifying and automatically solving inference inverse problems via inference. And my particular view, and the thing that I care about, and why I bounced from statistics department to information engineering department to computer science department to so on and so forth, is that I'm uh, I'm one of the, the I guess five, maybe more than that, but uh, I'm one of the people who actually believes that AI, or in particular artificial general intelligence beyond deep learning, is fundament fundamentally about solving inverse problems, and the tools of Bayesian inference are the mechanisms by which one will do this, and then if you're going to automate this entire procedure, like the deep learning systems have allowed the automation of nonlinear function approximation, we need languages that allow us to express inverse problems in a way that we can then iterate on model designs that include conditioning for AGI. Okay. Uh, as uh, as Wei-Chin mentioned, we actually that's what I'm doing these next few days. We've been three years trying to finish one chapter in this silly book, but there is a book called The Introduction to Probabilistic Programming. Uh, it's not the final version. Uh, most of what I'm talking about today is in the book. Uh, you can download it for free. It'll get published soon. Uh, our publishers are, are yelling, literally yelling at me at this point. So we'll, we'll get that done in the next couple of weeks. But if you haven't looked at it or you're unaware of this resource and you're curious about the things that I'm talking about, uh, please check this out. And there'll be a new version forthcoming in the next, uh, by the end of the year. Anyway, okay. So. My goal, my personal research goal, research goal is AGI. That's what I care about. It's a huge economic win. It's a you know society changing, so on and so forth. But the way we get there, uh, and the way my group works, which my group is called the Programming Languages for Artificial Intelligence Group, that's down here, is we move in that direction. We build languages, models, and that sort of thing. But along the way, we kind of do some interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, and we've moved from sort of really fundamental inference algorithm development uh, and you know uh, language design and these sorts of things to starting to show off some of the things that we can do. Okay, uh, and I think <clears throat> often when I speak particularly to statistic audiences, it's kind of eye-opening what's what what people can do with the kind of languages that we've designed over the last several years. So many of you can probably identify this machine by just looking at it. Uh, if not, um, don't feel don't feel bad. It's the Atlas detector on the main beam line uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, so one of the one of the things that we can do, and one of the sort of spin off things on the way to demonstrating, uh, you know, it, on the way to HI, like demonstration, like uh, engineering applications, is <clears throat> like figuring out what happens in, an, in a high energy event at the Large Hadron Collider right, is actually an inverse problem. Right. And arguably the best uh, model, the most precise probabilistic model developed by humankind is the standard model, uh, <clears throat> actually the standard model of physics, right? So it gives, it gives the probabilistic uh, interpretation of what's going to happen of, uh, in, in all the high energy uh, transitions between particle types and showers and that sort of thing, okay? So the standard model exists mathematically, but not really. It actually exists as a one million line C++ uh, uh, simulator, uh, you know, piece of code. That's the, the standard model, right? So we can simulate, and this is exactly how they design the machines. We can simulate what happens in the Atlas detector, right? So basically, you can run this, and this is actually this shows the control flow of the of the standard model simulation program. So that's that. These are not part of this interactive. These are actually. Um, uh, uh, sequences of random number draws in the simulator that give rise to simulated events like this inside of the Alice Okay, so one of the things that we've demonstrated that we can do with the kind of tool chain that we, uh, the things we'll be talking about today is that we can take um, uh, Atlas detector observations, or actually a sub part here because we, we did scale all the way, and we can, we can do inference inside this one billion line C++ simulator, generative model of these events automatically, okay? So you can just take this, this code, uh, you know, uh, instrument it in a, in a very, very small number of locations and then do posterior inference over the particle type and momenta and everything else inside of this massive, massive simulator. This was the best paper uh, finalist at, uh, at supercomputing last year <clears throat> and a paper at Europe's as well. 
And also we hold the record for the largest PyTorch uh, 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 training on CPU uh, ever. Uh, we, uh, we ran at, the, at, at Berkeley Labs on 32,000 CPUs for quite a long time in order to actually build this thing. But the infrastructure is built, right? It's big compute, but the infrastructure is built. You can just do this, okay? <clears throat> Everybody has flown an airplane, presumably in an airplane. Uh, uh, if not, uh, you know, I didn't until I was 19, that's okay. Uh, but anyway, so um, I, every time I look out the windows, I get a little bit nervous about, uh, about like seeing the wings flap, right? Uh, I don't know if you notice it or not, but here's, a, here's, the, here's the testing facility for uh, wings on a modern, modern aircraft, right? Uh, so they, they can take quite about quite a bit of flex, but they still can fail, right? And the question is, what? Here's a question for the audience. Let's get it, get some engagement. What does what in modern aircraft does this picture have to do with this picture? Nothing really is it, maybe, what time is it there. It's lunch maybe, maybe like maybe like alloy development. Okay, yeah, you're th you're you're on you're on the right you're you're on the right track, um, but the reason why wings can flex like this and not not to uh, not not break is that they're basically all composites, right? And what are composites? They're actually uh, a epoxy and you know carbon fiber uh, cupcakes. Basically, they 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 cure them in an oven. Okay, so if you take a part like over here and you you know take a, a one dimensional slice through it like like so so you can think of this as like a for instance part of a wing or something like that there are vast computational like probabilistic computational stochastic modeling efforts to try to figure out what happens during the curing process to make sure that the wings cure appropriately so that they don't crack under load that you can only test them destructively if you like drill in and make sure that the thing is actually uh worked out all right that's not that's not good so what you need to do is actually be able to measure some so basically this what you see here is a is a, a simulation of the temperature profile over the depth of a part over time during the cooking process and high like light colors are high temperatures and low colors are low temperatures okay so there's a non-trivial heat transfer that happens during the cooking of a part convergent to the company that we work with that that uh, builds simulators i.e statistical models of this temperature process. So every single one of these points right here is a latent variable in some model, right? Like there's millions and millions of latent variables here, right? It's the temperatures at all times, at all depths during some curing process, okay? So cool. If you do non-destructive uh, te part testing in, so in something like this, right? You can only put a little temperature probe on, a, on the surface unless you want to drill in and then your wing is ruined, right? So you put a little temperature probe, tro probe on the surface and you measure surface temperatures. And what they care about is the internal temperature of the part, the maximum internal temperature over the, over the part, you know, basically integrated over this entire latent state. So here, here's a little thermometer and we're, we care about the maximum temperature in this, in this region. And okay. hopefully this makes sense so far. So we have a probabilistic generative model of temperatures. And what we want to be able to do is condition on the surface temperature of the, the, the part and ask what the posterior distribution over the maximum temperature at this particular time and this, at this particular depth is, okay? Again, our software tool chains can do this. So on the, on the left, we have uh, you know, a very long running, crazily long running Markov chain that actually computes the posterior distribution over temperatures. On the right over here, we have uh, um, a faster version of this doesn't really matter. Uh, the point is that we can actually do, we can again, instrument the simulator. It's a big, big, big probability model. We can instrument it with a few lines of code and automatically do this, this solve this inference problem. Anybody know what this is? This is fun. Yeah, I told you this is gonna, we're going fast, fast and crazy, okay? How about this? That's C. elegans. There you go. It's a nem nematode roundworm C. elegans, right? Okay, great. It's also the only organism in which the full connectome is known. And we can actually simulate those neurons uh, um, individually and the body individually. The better part, the best part is, and many of you may not know this, is that modern neuroscientists have developed the ability to actually see wh what individual neurons in the organism are doing while it's behaving, <laughs> okay? So these little white spots here are calcium concentration changes. Um, as in the head of the worm, as the worm is swimming around, okay? So 
Uh, here's another crazy uh, simulator that we can we can do inference in automatically, right? So we can take the full C. elegans simulator and condition on only a subset of the of the neural activities of the the the, the uh, an awakened behaving worm. Get the posterior distribution of the the brain state of the rest of the worm and predict the 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 body do posterior predictive inference on the body position of the worm. Okay, cool. So. We have, if you're not doing probabilistic programming or whatever, you're not paying attention or you don't, you know, like you're worried about concentration bounds or whatever, that's cool, that's great. But what I what I wanna want you to know is that over the last, you know, like almost decade now, right? Massive progress has been made in probabilistic programming and we can do some pretty ridiculous things now, okay? So from 2014 to 2019, and I sort of got into probabilistic programming in 2014, there, thereabouts, right? We were worried a lot about language design, and we were really coming from the world of statistics, where basically we have a model, okay? This is the standard statistics setup. You have a model, and you'd like to do inference in that model one time, right? Like you want to really understand your data and, 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 and do something, okay? And this gave rise to languages like STAN, which started when I was at Columbia, and my research language called Anglican, which probably none of you have seen or, or, or used. Then basically we said wait a second if we want to do that ml ai thing then actually what we care about is rapid inference so none of this markov chain monte carlo stuff that's too takes too long you never be able to use it in an organism something like that so we started for an engineering application so we started talking about an amortized inference so where you have the model but you want to be able to do repeated inference rapidly and then we said well wait a second actually you know we don't know how to write down models for basically anything <laughs> right uh, like we can we can write down graphical models for something, but you know try writing down a good graphical model that generates images, right? Or try write you know like whatever, like not going to happen. Uh, or write down a good generative model that generates those temperature profiles. Well, that thing is some crazy simulator. If you're really going to write a good model, you have to invest huge amounts of time and energy. But if you're going to write a model of like how the world transitions, no, you're not going to you're not going to write that down. So you have to learn it, right? Uh, so we said, okay, well, where we are now is deep probabilistic programming. We'll get to that at the very end, if we have time, hopefully we will, where we want to do rapid amortized repeated inference, but we actually have to learn the model as well. Okay, so I just showed you basically, I did, um, usually in my talks, I spend a lot of time doing technical stuff, talking about inference algorithms and like, uh, you know, more statistic type things uh, here. I decided, you know what, let's, let's have fun. It's COVID times, you know, these kind of seminars suck. So let's, you know, let's, let, let's have some fun. So I started showing you stuff from here, basically. Okay. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about amortized inference and some of the fun things that we're doing there. And then I'm going to transition to deep probabilistic programming and talk about what's happening there. Okay. So the outline of the non show off part of the talk, well, that's all show off -y, that's, let's be honest, but like the, the, the outline is basically we're going to talk about amortized inference, then we're going to talk about model learning, and then we're going to talk about meta learning and sort of bring all of these things together. Okay, so what do I mean by amortized inference? I already told you that, um, uh, that our joint distributions are over latent variables X and observed variables Y, and here's a graphical model of some, of some, some generative model, okay? We're going to assume that this is written down. It's, there are no free parameters in this model. We've written it down. We know what the what, what the model is, and we want to perform inference in it. And we all know that you can do you can do model learning via inference in a hierarchical model. Like don't 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 don't, don't get confused, right? What, what what I'm saying is we have a fully specified model at, at, at some level. Like we've set the values of all of our priors, and now we want to do inference. <clears throat> what we want to be able to do is actually learn some artifact Q, which basically approximates the posterior distribution of the latent variables given the observed variables very rapidly, generally speaking in constant time. Okay. Now we all know, okay, yeah, well, anyway, that's, that's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> if we want to match this uh, uh, artifact uh, or build an artifact that, 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 that does this computation efficiently, really what we're saying is that we want to, to uh, basically minimize some divergence between the posterior distribution uh, and this artifact uh, averaged over all possible uh, observations that we would get such that when you uh, you know deploy this this artifact you you have some sort of very very rapid inference again constant time inference okay and in the probabilistic programming literature if you look at it uh, <clears throat> you will 
see two different kinds of terminology for this. One is the uh, is called guide programs, uh, and the other one are called inference networks. Uh, and the difference between them is basically which KL you uh, minimize, whether you uh, minimize the exclusive KL or the inclusive KL. Okay, and we can go go through the technical details of these. But for the time being, we're going to be over here. Okay, so you can you you can look over here. And this is basically the important sampling uh, optimal proposal uh, distribution mechanism, and so on and so forth. So. This is the KL divergence between P and Q in this, this order, averaged over all data. Okay. And basically it's the importance distribution for sampling from some, some true posterior distribution. Okay. So KL divergence is, is here. We average it over the, 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 the full data. Great. And if you look very closely, you'll see that this is just a joint distribution over the model here. So we're, we, that's what we're going to do right here. So if we want to learn an inference network using this inclusive so again, inference network using this inclusive KL. What we want to do is basically we want to learn to in invert the generative model before seeing any data. So uh, the loss function that we would seek to, to, to optimize is the average over all possible observations uh, of this, this KL. We want to minimize this, this KL. The only terms that have phi in it are this term, and this average basically combines with, with, with this posterior to be a, 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 an expectation over the joint distribution, right? of minus log phi q given y, x, x given y, okay? And you can minimize this with stochastic gradient descent uh, by sampling from the model, okay? Great, all right. Everybody make this make sense or is this too fast for everybody? It, it's super fast, but I wanna get to some fun stuff. So uh, make sense, questions? I take questions now because it's gonna, it's gonna lose a bunch of people really fast if I haven't lost you already. Uh, so normally in variational inference, you minimize the expectation over Q. Uh, and so I was just curious why we're focused on minimizing over the data distribution instead and like what advantages that could have. Great question. And if we get to the end, I'm going to go through it enough times that it, that, that it, that will, uh, that it will, that it will make sense. Um, <clears throat> some of the advantages are hinted at here. You don't have to do any reparameterization at all. You, there's no, uh, you don't have to do any reinforce. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, so this is an easier, uh, it's an easier uh, objective to work with basically. Okay? Uh, um, and it's really what you want to do when you're doing important sampling or important weighted estimation in any sort of a, in, in any sort of a situation because the thing that you learn is mass covering rather than uh, uh, being uh, uh, mode seeking, which means that you are likely to get good importance weights even if you have a funky posterior. Okay. So great question, but that means that at least one person is hanging on, which is which is wonderful. Cool. <clears throat> All right. So it's like it, basically what we're saying is <laughs> like if you really look at oops, if you really look at this, we're saying, look, we can do supervised learning using samples from our generative model. There's nothing really fancy going on here, right? We can always make fancy maths. Okay. So what what is it? What do we mean when we're talking about amortized inference? If you haven't seen this concept before, right? <clears throat> if we have some, let's say for instance, regression model. And here we have three different example uh, inference tasks. So the black dots here are the data items, and I'll show you what the model is in just a second. The, the blue lines here are the prior distribution over the regression function, right? Um, if you do, you know, set up some sort of Markov chain Monte Carlo, Mark, you know, Metropolis Hastings or Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm and do posterior inference over the parameters of the regression model, given this data, you get some sort of distribution over, over functions, right? What amortized inference says, and this is, this, is, this is another sort of advantage of looking at things this way, is what amortized inference says is that the proposal, this Q thing that we're talking about is immediately going to sit out, spit out parameter, this is going to take the data items, these black dots, and immediately spit out uh, parameters for the, the model, okay? Or a distribution over parameters for the model. And, in, and the way it does it is it, it, it is compatible with inference, uh, with important sampling, basically computing importance weights by weighting by the joint distribution and then normalizing, right? So the proposal distribution comes from this amortized inference artifact, and then you can clean it up using important sampling to get a posterior that, that's here in green, 
Okay, so this example comes from this particular graphical model. Okay, so what I'm talking about here really now we can boil it way down to graphical models and forget all the probabilistic programming stuff for a second, right? So here's some some graphical model that happens to be a heavy tail, uh, you know, polynomial regression model. So the weights are the plus distributed, and then the 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 targets are key distributed polynomial, second order polynomial with some 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 variance like parameter, right? <clears throat> So what does an inference network do? It says, okay, well, we have this graphical model and we have to transform it into some computation that takes the data, the observations, and computes in the other direction. It actually produces the weights from the, the regression weights from the data, right? And basically we know that, you know, like we can't actually program something like this, right? If we could, then, you know, Bob's your uncle, right? So what we what we do instead is we say, okay, well, respecting the dependency structure of this inverse graphical model, we basically build some sort of neural artifact and then we train this uh, using samples from from the, the generative model. Okay, so that's uh, some, a neural artifact that looks like this is what we what we use to produce uh, these simple results. And in fact, uh, the crazy applications that I showed at the very beginning are basically all examples of taking this technique and just making it as extreme as possible in the engineering sense okay but you can ask okay so well we all know what graphical models are why would we actually bother with all this probabilistic programming stuff isn't it kind of the same thing and the answer is yeah maybe but you you actually can use some programming languages tech tools and techniques to uh to automate a lot of this stuff uh, particularly in the graphical modeling context. So we wrote a couple of papers, uh, one called the faithful inversion of generative models for effective amortized inference, and another one that's very recent called continuous conditional normalizing flows for efficient amortized inference of graphical models. And the basic idea is that you can take, whoops, um, you can take some program written in whatever language, Anglican, Pyro, PyTorch, whatever, and so long as it's a, what we call a first order probabilistic programming language, i.e. it can be compiled into a graphical model, the book tells you how to do this, then <clears throat> there exist now automated inference algorithms or automated programming languages transformation tools that can take in any arbitrary program, compile it to its corresponding graph, basically building up whatever link functions you need, and then automatically transforming the structure of this program into the structure of the inverse computation graph. Okay, that particular thing is called NAMI, and it comes out of this, this faithful inversion of generative models for effective amortized inference, and it constructs an inverse graphical model structure that's provably both faithful and minimal. Faithful in the sense that it contains sufficient edges to avoid encoding conditional independencies absent from the, the original generative model and minimal in that it contains no unnecessary edges. So it's basically as efficient as possible computationally. In other words, removing any edge would result in an unfaithful structure. And basically, you know, the algorithm is actually a little bit complicated. It effectively works by, by simulating variable elimination and like building a click tree and da, 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 da. At the end of the day, the take home is you start with some graphical model where all of the, the graphical model edges go out to the observations as you would expect in the generative model. And at the end of the day, you get a graphical model that starts from the, the observed data and goes back to the latent variables, but the structure of that computation of that particular graphical model is such that it, you know, it, the, the graphical model structure, it, basically this is an eye, they're independent maps of each other. Okay, so it, 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 you know, there are no conditional, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'll say it again, it, it, the, 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 the resulting graphical model contain sufficient edges to avoid any con condition, you know, basically introducing any conditional ind independencies that you didn't stick in the original model. Okay, so great. We can we can do crazy, crazy stuff with this now. Uh, so we can take models like this, okay, and this model over here. So this is the structured conditional con continuous nor normalizing flows. This is a model where <laughs> I'm just gonna just touch on this just to sort of get you thinking, right? So this is an amortized uh, convolution. This is an amortized probabilistic deconvolution. Okay, so we can build the graphical model of the convolution operator on a, a, a convolution. You know, like think of an image space. You convolve a filter over an, over an image, and you get you know. So here's an input image. This is an in. Here's a filter, and x out is the result of the convolution, right? 
So wouldn't it be cool if we had a convolution operator, <laughs> a deconvolution operator that was prop properly probabilistic? Okay? So we can use the tools that I just talked about to form the computation graph, form the inverse graph, and then do amortized inference to build probabilistic deconvolution, which is what you should be doing anyway when you're doing convolution. You shouldn't be using decon nets. You should be doing probabilistic deconvolution, de decon nets, because like addition, convolution is onto, right? So, or rather many to one, okay? So, <clears throat> all right, cool. Now, okay, all right. This is fast and furious, I'm not gonna be bored. Take questions uh, anytime, just, you know, like, I know you don't know where I'm going, so it's, it's, it's crazy, but, you know, ask questions if, if, if you want to, don't forget. So these, these, oops, these techniques apply, you know, when, the, when you have a graphical model, right? But the things that I started talking about in the beginning were very, very, very complicated simulators, right? They have control flow and conditional branching and, and, and you know, conditional existence of, of random variables, so on and so forth. So what do we do when there is no probabilistic program graphical model co correspondence? You can't like, you can't uh, uh, unroll the computation graph and explicitly instantiate every random variable because actually probabilistic programs that are written in Turing complete languages correspond to Bayesian non-parametric models, okay? <clears throat> you can't invert it because the graphical model has an infinite number of nodes, okay? So what can you do? Well, <clears throat> you can basically do the same thing, but you can only, you can't do the graphical model inversion thing, but you can do basically sequential important sampling or something like that. So you can use the same important sampling proposal learning objective, right? So here it's exactly the same thing as before. So we're gonna sample from our generative model. Now it's going to be some big program and you should be thinking, uh, you should be thinking all the while, okay, how the heck did they do this, you know, standard model, <laughs> uh, inversion thing in a way that's, you know, computationally efficient and actually works, right? Well, we said, all right, well, we have the standard model code. That's the joint distribution P of X, Y. And now we're just going to train some crazy neural network that, that, that takes the observation, embeds it somehow, and then produces a posterior distribution over all of the random choices that could ever be made in the evolving program. Okay. Now that's, there's some technical details that you have to work through to, to, to get that, right? Uh, so that the, you know, but inference at the end of the day says, okay, we're going to make proposals for every one of the random variables as the program is running. And up here on the top, this is, these are, this is basically just the, the simulator. So there's the, the, the internal random variables of the simulator. These are the X's. And then there are the observed quantities. Those would be, for instance, the energies deposited in various detectors. Okay. So if you just do important sampling or sequential important sampling, uh, <clears throat> then you can generate, uh, you know, importance weights using a proposal distribution that factorizes like this. Uh, this is a, you know, again, fast and furious, but the, the basic idea is really, really straightforward. There is some neural network that takes you from observations and all previous random, random choices made in the simulator, and it proposes values for the next random variable made in the simulator. So if you, if you do any sort of control theory or something like this, this is basically a, a controller uh, for the a simulator that directs the simulator to take random choices that lead to the observations. Okay? And if you train this in the same sort of amortized way that we were talking about, then no matter what the observation you get, then this crazy, massive deep neural network thing um, is able to figure out how to control the program in a way that most of the execution traces go to the observed data. Okay? So that's what we show here, and I can go, I have extra slides that we can go through the details if you're really, really interested. But basically, there is some sort of in, embedding of the observation. So the, the proposal the architecture for sequential important sampling in arbitrary simulators is some sort of big, big neural network that embeds the observation here. I've just put a CNN block, but there's some sort of embedding. And then there's some sort of recurrent neural network architecture that, that <clears throat> um, generates each latent variable in turn conditioned on all the previous latent variables and the, the, the observation. And here are all the latent variables. And that proposal then marries with the, the simulators. You execute them both simultaneously and you get importance weights that you can use for posterior inference. And of course, we all know that important sampling sucks except when you have a really good proposal. When you have a really, really good, good, good proposal, then important sampling is the best you can do. Uh, because ideally you'd be drawing directly from the posterior. And that's, uh, that's what we find. We can basically 
the, the magic of deep learning is that we can make this architecture so big uh, and pre-train it so well that our important sampling procedures basically sample directly, directly from the posterior. <clears throat> and in this paper, there's another example of a, of a, of uh, you know, one of these higher order probabilistic programming languages in which we do this kind of inference, you know, uh, and uh, highlighting the, 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 the speed of, of inference, right? So if you want to do CAPTCHA breaking, you can do this doing, you know, you can write generative models for each of the different CAPTCHA styles, and then you can learn inference artifacts that do rapid posterior inference in these simulator programs. And you can now start to think about maybe doing AI like things because we can break these captures uh, in very, very, very little time at like human perception speeds because we have this amortized inference artifact. Okay. Again, the same, 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 same story. Okay. And you get posterior uncertainties, which again, if you believe that we actually use uncertainties when we're acting in the world or thinking about how to plan for the world or so on and so forth you want those uncertainties and we do actually get those un un uncertainties, which you can see here. Basically, you see the uncertainties about, uh, for instance, which letters these are and so on and so forth. These are just sequences of posterior samples from a trained amortized inference artifact in a generative model written in a programming language that generates captures, yada, yada, yada. Okay, cool. <clears throat> this exists, if you're interested in this, this, uh, this is uh, code written by a postdoc of mine at, uh, at at Oxford, his name is Gunish Biden. He's here. It's called PyProm. You can interface to basically any um, existing simulator that you would like to, including graphical models. You can write your own in Python. You can do whatever you want. And it's a it's sort of a it's a language that people are unaware of relative to Pyro and Stan and these sorts of things. But um, it has a very particular use case, which is basically in, in, in inverting these simulators. Uh, so we did something like this actually uh, in, a, in, a, in a response to the COVID crisis where there are epidemiology simulators, multi-agent epidemi epidemiology simulators. Uh, and if you go here, you can see an, uh, an interfacing of PyProb to a, an, ep uh, an epidemiology simulator out of, uh, uh, I think Penn State, uh, or Pitt, I think Pitt, um, University of Pittsburgh called FRED, which simulates uh, uh, um, uh, influenza transmission um, in a multi-agent simulator of populations moving around. Uh, so what you see here are actually posterior distributions over uh, uh, over <laughs> influenza mm, uh, an influenza outbreak in Allegheny County, conditioned on various interventions being put in place. So this won a, an award from CBAR, and we're talking to the X. There's an X Prize that's coming up relatively soon. That that they're they're uh, that they're, they're basically using this work in. Uh, so cool. So one of the questions that I believe Derek asked was, you know, like what, what are the pros and cons of, of, of inference compilation or doing or basically messing around with this style of, of, uh, of, of KL, KL divergence um, and a, assuming that the model exists, right? So you have a model that exists and then you, uh, um, optimize the inclusive KL. The pros are you have infinite training data. You don't have to do any reparameterization. You don't need, no, you don't need uh, control variance. You can perform inference in pre-existing simulators or pre-existing models. So I, the, I guess the thing that I want to do when I come to statistics departments and talk is say, okay, look, we know we've got graphical models. We know we've got non-parametric models, so on and so forth, but really broaden your idea of what a model is. A model is everything up to a stochastic simulator that, you know, great. You can perform an inference in these things, and they're very interesting mathematical objects to, to, to think about. The cons are the choice of embedding architecture is largely ad hoc. It's super important, though. Uh, and maybe more importantly, you have to run the generative model program during inference. Okay? And many stochastic simulators are really, really slow. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so basically, the complexity of inference is still dictated or limited by the generative model com computational complexity. And this gives rise to, to what we call surrogate modeling. And I'm not going to talk about that at all today. But this paper, Deep Probabilistic Surrogate Networks for Universal Simula Simulator Approximation, is actually what we use to do this, um, this material curing thing. The, the simulator is super ridiculously slow. But actually, what I showed you when I showed you the videos of the results of posterior inference was posterior inference in a surrogate model learned that's 90 times faster than the original simulator. Okay, So we basically use deep neural networks to 
learn the generative model from the generative model simulator and to learn an, an efficient amortized inference uh, artifact for the same. Cool. The other thing that kind of stinks about, uh, about this inference compilation business is that you need to know the model, right? And if you're in the AI um, ML sort of context, right, it's pretty unrealistic to think that you actually know how to write down the model in most situations. So we know we have to do parameter estimation and so on and so forth anyway. Uh, so like, how do we do model learning, right? So how do we learn theta, okay? Now the AI perspective on this is pretty cool, right? So, <laughs> uh, <coughs> and, and it's related to this, I don't know if, how many of you know the Helmholtz machine? Anybody know the, fuck, I, uh, do people know the Helmholtz machine? Anybody heard of the Hel Helmholtz machine? No? Okay, so the Helmholtz machine actually pre, pre, predates the, the variational autoencoder and it's basically the same kind of idea. That basically the, the variational autoencoder is an instantiation of the Helmholtz machine. And the idea is that uh, it's, it comes from like computational neuroscience and, 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 uh, uh, and cognitive science. The idea, you know, it's very much very Josh Tenenbaum and me kind of idea uh, where basically the idea is that we have some model, the idea is we have some model of the world. We have a generative model of the world, the next state of the world or so on and so forth. And we sort of go between uh, learning and doing rapid inference using some sort of trained inference network, which approximates the posterior distribution of our latent variable understanding of the world uh, given our actual observations of the world. And we have a model, a generative model that allows us to actually hallucinate uh, new worlds. And this, this is relevant for model-based RL and you know, control as inference and so on and so forth. The basic idea is that you have this generative model, right? So, <clears throat> uh, you know, if you take some, I, I, I can tell that this slide is, a, is, is now a year old, sorry, I'm actually 46, not 45, you know, pudgy, white, bald, male, right? And you push this through some generative model and bang, you get an actual observation of me. And yes, when I, when I shave, I actually look much, much younger. Now I look like, you know, some sort of old Santa Claus, which is terrible. Anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, and, you know, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to form our actions in based on some sort of latent variable representation of the world right and we need to be able to get that latent variable representation of the world rapidly when we're when we're out in the world actually observing our wise right now the problem is like it's pretty di difficult to write down a model that goes from these latent variables to generate that right the actual pixel space observation so that's really what we're talking about here okay and variational autoencoders are an instantiation of helmholtz machines here we're looking at the the, the standard evidence lower bound we're we're going to simultaneously learn model parameters and we're going to use the inference network both to help model learning but also then to to be an amortized inference artifact that allows us to do rapid amortized posterior inference okay fine so Cool. Uh, and I, and I assume, I'm not going to not going to do this out, but I assume everybody's familiar with the elbow. If you're not, then you know, like look up any of your favorite variational inference uh, 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 articles. The, the basic idea is that you know, here's the the marginal likelihood of the data or the evidence or whatever, and the evidence is bounded uh, below by this, and the gap is a KL divergence, and you basically. Uh, uh, aim to, to, you know, by, by maximizing the elbow, you minimize the KL and maximize the, 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 the marginal uh, evidence of the data um, simultaneously. So this is the objective that we're going to play with. And we're going to use this both for model learning and for uh, inference network parameter learning. And just for the fun of it, um, the question that Derek asked was very much right on point because the rest of sort of the, the high level view of what's going on is, okay, well, we know how to do amortized inference. We've been talking about doing amortized inference with the opposite KL, right? Uh, model learning, given a good amortized inference network is easy, okay? Like model learning is easy. You just, you know, you take posterior expectations, you basically take posterior expectations or some version of posterior expectations and you learn model parameters, right? By, by effectively maximum likelihood when you have posterior uh, uh, samples. What's not easy is when you try to take, for instance, gradients of this objective with respect to phi, this term right here really screws you up, right? Okay. So, and this is, I would say the engineering and mathematical effort of deep probabilistic programming, the sort of the bottom right corner of this, 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 this cube, because deep probabilistic programs are roughly equivalent to structured variational autoencoders. 
So a paper called Learning Disentangled Representations of Semi-Supervised Deep Generative Models that came out in 2017, kind of set the stage, in fact, more or less explicitly set the stage. So Prop Torch was a language that came out of my group is now uh, at uh, Northeastern and Pyro came out of this thinking as well, very directly. In fact, this paper stomped on the original Pyro paper just because they happened to come out at the exact same time. They basically talk about the same thing, okay? so. Uh, the idea is that we want to do model learning and simultaneous uh, inference network learning in structured VAEs uh, and in model families that are more complicated than just VAEs as well that control that contain control flow and, and, and these sorts of things. Okay. So while we started working on this, we said, okay, well, we're, if we're going to work on model learning, let's, let's uh, like, you know, let's do the best job of model learning we possibly can. And I don't know what papers of mine you've looked at or, or whatever, or how you see the literature in this space, or if you know anything about the literature in this space. But a lot of the time that we spent over the last several years is thinking about uh, how do we make, how do we use more computation to make the elbow tighter and basically do a better job of learning the model and inference network. Okay. And this gave rise to a bunch of, bunch of ideas. So we have this elbow, this is our objective, right? And, you know, uh, Berta et al. basically said, okay, well, we can, you know, why, why do we use one sample from our importance network for model learning? Let's, let's do, you know, importance weighted uh, uh, or important sampling, use Q explicitly as an important sample and compute the, uh, the an estimate of the normalizing constant or estimate, estimate of the marginal probability here uh, and, you know, uh, learn the model using, using uh, an importance weighted estimator, okay? We said, okay, well, that, look, that, that, that looks pretty good for, uh, for learning the, the, the model. Well, in probabilistic programming in particular, we use a lot of sequential Monte Carlo. Again, I'm not gonna talk about sequential Monte Carlo, but it turns out that basically three of us all at the same time said, actually any uh, you know, sample-based marginal likelihood estimator can be, can be plugged in here, including the marginal probability estimate from, uh, from sequential Monte Carlo. And we can do a better job of model learning by uh, basically tightening the bound by uh, using multi-sample objectives to get the bounds tighter, to get better models, so on and so forth. But while we were doing this, well, okay, so, and, and, and we can demonstrate this. So, you know, here is Iway, here's auto-encoding sequential Monte Carlo, here's, uh, you know, learning over time, and here's basically the elbow, you know, using sequential Monte Carlo for model learning, good. Like, you're not gonna do a whole lot better. Uh, <clears throat> but we figured out, whoops, actually, when we're doing this model learning thing, our inference networks all of a sudden started to suck, right? Okay, so oh no. Okay, so th then we 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 basically put a little warning out there saying tighter variational bounds are not necessarily better, which is to say that if you use more particles and an importance weighted autoencoder or a sequential Monte Carlo kind of uh, uh, an ASMC or or uh, whatever. Uh, uh, estimate of the marginal probability or a bound, elbow bound or elbow, uh, the tighter the variational bound, you know, they do tighten the variational bound, which results in better learning, but they make the, the inference network worse. And the intuition is that, that if you think about it, the number, the more particles that you use, um, basically, if you take the number of particles in an importance weighted autoencoder or in a sequential Monte Carlo estimate of the marginal probability um, uh, to infinity, then you don't care where those particles came from. The inference network is completely irrelevant. You can use anything you want. Uh, and it like, so the learning signal basically degrades. So the quality of the inference network goes down uh, as a function of the tightness of the variational bound via these, these, uh, these multi-sample methods, which made us think about you know, something else. And now this goes back to the original, uh, the original inference compilation objective. It says, okay, well, you know, great, we can do model learning just fine by maximizing the elbow with some inference network. But wait a second, actually, the original Helmholtz machine also introduced an algorithm called wake sleep, which basically said, okay, screw the unified objective, we're going to learn the model using, you know, by ascending the elbow with respect to theta, and we're going to learn our inference networks by minimizing the inclusive KL. Okay. And you know, basically the idea is, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you 
what I just said, you learn the model here and you learn the, the inference network parameters here. This turns out to work really, really well in incredibly complicated models. So here we have a tendon for repeat uh, and here's the number of particles and here's the marginal probability estimate. Basically, it, we, we went back and said, hey, this really old algorithm actually does exactly what you want. You get better models and you get better inference networks simultaneously. So why are we doing this crazy variational inference thing? Like, it, like it, for inference, it, there's a little bit of a, there, yeah, it, it, they're not quite compatible with, for the AI application of simultaneous model and inference network learning. We're still struggling with this. And the, the, the most recent thing that we body of work in this, in this, um, in this, in this line of, of, of learn the model and inference network simultaneously, we, uh, I don't know, many of you, some of you might just have seen or heard of the thermodynamic variational objective. It's a new objective for training both continuous and discrete gen generative models that's as broadly applicable as the elbow. It achieves state of the art model and inference that we're learning without having to use a reparameterization trick. It generalizes the objectives used in variational inference, variational autoencoders, wake sleep, and inference comp compilation. And it arises from a novel connection between thermodynamic integration and variational inference. And all I'm going to say about the, the TVO is this one picture, right? So if you want a better bound on um, a marginal probability or a, 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 you know, uh, a better bound on the, on, on the evidence, there's lots of ways to do it. Multi-sample objectives are one way to do it. Another way is to set up a thermodynamic integra in integration uh, uh, objective, which basically says via some magic algebra related to thermodynamic integration that the area under this curve is the, uh, the, the, the evidence, right? And it turns out that if you take and you, you make the right choices of, the, the, of how to construct this curve, basically the path, uh, then you can uh, you can show that the elbow is a one-term left Riemann approximation to this thermodynamic in, 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 in integral, and the TVO basically is a is a multi uh, is a is a is a left Riemann approximation consisting of integration with respect to a bunch of different intermediate distributions that you can generate via important sampling very directly. Okay, so. Basically, you can you can construct tighter bounds in a way that doesn't screw up your inference networks using the TDO. So it's 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 a better model learning, better inference network learning. Cool. Okay, I think I'm mostly out of time. Then I'm going to show you just a couple of examples and then then then, then wind up. Okay. So last thing I want to say, and this is just just to sort of say, you know, what do you get from these kinds of seminars? If you get from anything from these seminars, it's like, okay, where should I be looking for really cool, interesting research? Problems? So uh, here, let me just let me just say this, and this is where we have kind of moved as a group now. So meta learning, neural processes, amortized inference, and a simul and simultaneously uh, in a simultaneously learned model, they're all the same thing. Okay, turns out that if you just spend enough time, you know, spend two or three months <laughs> looking at all the papers and like doing all the stuff, they're all exactly the same thing. And meta learning. Uh, in, in particular, and this uh, I'll just say, you can ask me about it, and I can explain it in, in more detail, uh, is the way, it's the only way to achieve the just-in-time just compilation artifacts that operationalize the formal semantics of higher, prob higher order probabilistic programming. So for the mathy ones of you, uh, if you want to know what this higher order probabilistic programming mumbo jumbo is really about, you should look at this semantics for probabilistic programming, higher order functions, continuous distribution, and, and, and constraints, because it establishes mathematically what the objects are that we're manipulating. So it gives us a formal semantics for the languages that we're, that we're playing with. There's an operator in the semantics called norm, which basically computes the normalizing constant or, or, or does the conditioning operation. And if you want to do this in a nested context, the only way that you can do this is via meta learning. Okay. And meta learning, you know, I, I think I, I, I'm out of time. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip through and just show you a couple of things that we can do right now. Meta learning is roughly something like something like this. I'll, I'll just go right to here. The, the objective is some, some graphical model like this, where you have a bunch of training data, you have some input output pairs, okay? uh, you have uh, an, input pair, an input for which you would like to produce a, 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 an output, uh, you have a regression parameter that's latent, and you have some sort of model specific parameter that's, that's task specific. Okay? So the idea might be that you know, have a test input that you'd like to produce a label for, and you have a bunch of labeled images, and this is going to be D. Okay, and you'd like to be able to do very, very rapid posterior inference over the the latent regression parameters, uh, 
such that you can produce a good uh, output for this new input. Okay, so for for us, this is the model learning, and uh, so this is the, this is the model learning component of of, of meta learning, and the amortized inference are part of meta learning is you want a very very rapid uh, approximation to the posterior distribution over this regression parameter given the uh, 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 labeled data. Then you can do fast test time posterior predictive inference, okay, like this. And the, the, the kinds of things that you can do with this are just crazy, honestly. Like, so here's a here's a few shot meta learning problem. So we're doing amortized inference in this. This is the op, this is the true object. Here are some views. So the context set, the the set of you know, the, the D on which you're conditioning is uh, images and angles, basically uh, viewpoints, right? And what we'd like to do is say, okay, give us this is all we get to. See. That's all we get to see. Images like this, and please give us this object. This object, whatever the object is, from this pose. Okay. Do you get this object, and you say, please give me the uh, the view of the object from another pose? Okay, great. There it is. And the context set grows along the vertical axis. So again, here's you know here's the context set poses of the object, views of the object from multiple views. I want the posterior distribution basically over the object from a different pose. But all you get are an increasing sequence of, of views of the object. <laughs> okay, great. We can learn theta and phi to do this basically in real time. Okay, uh, how about this? Uh, we can. Uh, we would like the posterior distribution over all of the black pixels, given the uh, the, the pixels that you can see that are non-black. Okay, and you get an increasing sequence of those, and these are posterior examples from the from the the the, the learned model. So basically, this is image completion. So we, have, you know, can generate, you know, faces, but we can do it conditionally, <laughs> conditioned on, you know, uh, subsets of the data. And we can do this for few shot image classification, but I'll leave that alone. Anyway, so what's the deal? At the end of the day, what I want to get across is that probabilistic programs is an entire spectrum. Okay, so there's graphical models, there's VAEs, there's structured VAEs, there's synthetic training data generators, there's simulators, and they, you know, they go from very, very, very simple neural architectures or very simple graphical models all the way to crazy, crazy, uh, uh, you know, multi-million line pieces of C plus plus simulation code. My personal question is like, where, you know, what is AGI going to require, right? We actually don't know really where on this spectrum of, of, of complex, you know, on this complexity spectrum of generative models, where we need to land in order to actually solve AI slash ML applications, right? Uh, you know, it's looking like maybe it's down here, but maybe it's over here. We really, really don't know. Uh, so my research over the last however many years has basically been to, to build tools that allow us to operate anywhere on this spectrum and to demonstrate some pretty cool capabilities largely over here but moving more and more into this land where I was just showing you stuff from 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 meta learning where we don't actually know the model parameters and I think it's a really really exciting time so uh you know, if you think about what deep learning did and, and so on and so forth, like automatic differentiation has been around since the 1950s. Okay. Right. Backprop was reinvented in the 80s. Neural networks spent a bunch of time in the in the in the in the garbage bin in the 90s, right? Deep neural networks really only showed up in the 20, you know, 15 range. Software packages that allow basically AD to be used widely led to the deep learning explosion. That's that's very very recent, right? And I would say that you know this year, last year, whatever, somewhere in this time, like people understand, right? They understand what a gradient is. And they understand optimization. They understand nonlinear function approximation. They understand that you know there, these tools exist and can be applied generally, and it's kind of easy, right? Like. Anybody can do it. You can do it in high school now, right? Probabilistic programming is, you know, it's lagging behind a little bit, right? It's harder, honestly. You know, probabilistic programming ideas sort of originated in the 90s, right? There were some early research languages, you know, uh, so on and so forth. There's some deep 
probabilistic programming systems that kind of came out after the, these differentiable programming languages uh, came out, but we're nowhere near sort of universal understanding such that, you know, graduate students at the University of Michigan don't derive their own inference algorithms uh, and use scan instead or use pyro or use pyprob and uh, it, we're, we're there's still some gap here right and i think that once this gap is 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 closed uh, really amazing things are going to happen because we're not not just going to have nonlinear function function approximation but we're going to have conditioning as a fundamental operation that everybody can can use so uh, I could, there's so many people that I would need to thank. I'm just not even going to bother trying. You can look at the list of alumni or current students at uh, the programming languages for artificial intelligence group. And I'll just say that UBC is an awesome, awesome place. Uh, and I'm actually currently looking for a postdoc right now. Uh, and I like taking people who are smarter than me and more mathematically talented than me. And that's generally speaking statistics uh, graduate students uh, and then turning them into dirty, gross machine learning people. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. Uh, like me, that is to say. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, I'll take as many questions as uh, you have the stomach for. And I'm sorry for running a little bit late. Yeah, thank you so much for giving the great talk. Um, is there any questions from the students or, or from the professor <laughs> Alice here? Uh, so I, I said kind of a general question. So it seems like there's kind of two, you know, you could roughly divide the users of ex or probabilistic programming into two groups. Like maybe there's like practitioners who are just using like a standard model and can use Stan or any of the other available packages. And then there's sort of, you know, people like us who are in statistics, who are developing new methods. So I'm kind of wondering, is your, in, like in the like perfect world in your, end goal of a probabilistic programming framework, would both users be able to use the same like language or how do you reconcile the needs of sort of these two different types of users? Um, <laughs> that is a really, really good, uh, 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 <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, Yeah, so my, uh, my deep-seated fear is that, um, and this, this will be borne out if you've ever tried to talk about conditioning with anybody who is not trained as a statistician or, or, you know, or a probabilistic machine learning person or something like that. My, my, my deep fear is that, um, that uh, that the user community for real powerful probabilistic programming languages is always going to be small because of the, the, the training required to even think in the way that you have to think. So I'm not certain, I'm fairly comfortable with, you know, Stan or bugs or, or, or whatever being, or you know, pi mc three being sufficient for uh, you know most trained statistician, you know, applied statistician users and use cases. Right. Uh, my sort of ideal scenario is that you know uh, we have the power of something like Pyro or uh, Turing or Anglican or or whatever. Um, uh, available to power users in some in, in, in some sense. Um, and my experience is that they're they're still not quite there. And I think a lot of that has to do with language design and like computer science concerns. So every time I train up kids in my own own group, even though I train them in the sort of probabilistic methods and all this sort of stuff, like there's a still a very large learning curve to be able to actually use the tools in anger. Right. And it mostly has to do with the the, it's a, some combination of thinking probabilistically and the uh, and thinking about conditioning as a fundamental operation, and some to do with like the fact that the languages are still there's there's still not quite there. The other thing that I'll respond to in your question is that um, 
Uh, the other, what I would like to see happen is, and this, this I still fight with my stat statistician uh, colleagues about, is that, um, you know, there's a pretty big cottage industry in, in, in certainly Bayesian statistics of building bespoke inference algorithms for certain model classes, right? And I think this is this this I think it's just a total waste of time. It's it's a dead end industry, and I really 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 want to go out and 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 to say just shake all of the, uh, all of those people and say like look computers are going to get faster, <laughs> right? And you should really really be thinking about inference algorithms that work for the broad set of uh, of problems, like all problems denotable in a higher order probabilistic programming language, or all problems denotable in a first order probabilistic programming language. This is harder. Uh, so basically, a lot of my my Bayesian statistician friends are basically doing assembly language programming. They're building, you know, bespoke inference algorithms for an X Y Z model model family that that have no chance of ever generalizing to the broader set of models. And that that I find a little bit depressing. Great question. Sorry, yeah, you, you made me think a lot about the person. Hopefully, it made sense for me. But yeah, yeah. So so can I ask a question? Thanks for the great talk, by the way. Um, I think I think I struggle on um, easier problems than you than you manage, but but I I you know the, the typical kind of problem that I I kind of think about is time series analysis, right? Relatively small data sets compared with you, but I I'm considering classes of models that are basically determined by a simulator. So I had some kind of sympathies with the kinds of thing you were talking about. We also have some experience with this um, um, programming language pump, which can be viewed as a probabilistic programming language. You kind of plug in a simulator and then it helps you do inference. And, and it works on arbitrary um, models. And we kind of get to, I don't know if anybody here has taken stats 531, but like master students get to, um, get to play with it. But you know, it, it has limits of scale and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about how to gain some of the power of the stuff you do, but I guess that's for, that's more for, um, for me to worry about, but I'm, I'm wondering like if, if somebody just, you know, has say a few thousand data points and an arbitrary, um, simulation based model, what, what, what would you recommend they do? Uh, it's a dynamic model, say. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, I think it, it depends pretty heavily on on the model class that you're actually considering, right? So if you're in, you know, if you're in a linear dynamical systems kind of model or something where you can do some sort of extended Coleman filtering kind of thing, then, you know, Stan is still going to be fine, right? Uh, yeah. But if you're actually in, in a broader set of families where, in a larger family where you're, for instance, simulators basically yeah sure uh then you know there's there's there are a, a large number and I'm, I'm sorry i did you know obviously you know i did not do a i did not pepper the the talk with lots and lots of of, of credit to other groups and so on and so forth i was basically talking about my own work but um uh there there are lots and lots of tool chains that that kind of address bits of this your, your own is one there's one here at uvc uh what's it called uh there's Libby, which from, from uh, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of Libby. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of sort of partial, um, partial solutions. Uh, I would, I would say that, uh, you know, Pyro, Pyprob, these systems, they actually have general purpose inference built, baked into them, right? So, I would pretty heavily recommend actually people that look, you know, look at Pyro or Pyprop and think hard about how to actually use those systems because they actually have sequential Monte Carlo built in. They actually have, you know, sort of really powerful inference, general purpose time series inference algorithms baked into them. The other thing that I would say, uh, although, uh, you know, um, I'm gonna, here I'm going to toot my own horn, but this is actually me communicating from one professor to another. Like Anglican is a is a is a you know was a really interesting research language. Language I would never say to use it for any practical application, but if you're looking for sort of 
state-of-the-art implementations of general purpose time series inference algorithms like iterated iterated conditional particle mcmc uh you know uh the, the particle cascade like all sorts of like very sophisticated time series inference algorithms the canonical implementations for those are in the anglican code base so um and what I would say is that if you look at the literature around that, if you're really interested in sort of general purpose inference algorithms or trying to find the difference between sort of inference algorithms that work for time series models, which, which are different to those which work for probabilistic programming systems by some very subtle, subtle characteristics, then, the, then the, 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 the literature surrounding Anglican and that sort of thing is basically all time series inference algorithms that are applicable in the probabilistic programming sense, but not in the not they're not specialized to to, to the time series sense, right? Uh, to be very technical about this, like if you um, if you do uh, so, time series modeling in the probabilistic pro program context. So, a, a probabilistic program can be interpreted as a time series, but the the the, the latent state of a probabilistic program is the entire virtual memory state of the machine. Right, so the size is getting kind of big pretty quickly. So uh, there's ways to there's ways to deal with that, but uh, what I'm saying is like I'm just trying to as quickly as possible since we don't yeah. you know don't have any real time to talk. But if we were to sit in a cafe for a long time and talk about okay, time series inference and probabilistic programming inference you can do all the time series inference stuff that you want, but you have to think when you're thinking in probabilistic programming land that the latent variable that you're playing with is the, the tape of the Turing machine. It's the, you know, the virtual memory address space of your process. It's the, it's the whatever. So that means you have to restrict yourself to, to time series models or inference methods that work with state space with a state space whose complexity looks like that. Okay, I think that, that was some interesting yeah. leads. I better let the students have it back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so following up on what you were just talking about, so I guess like with time series models, one of the things like I, I do a little bit of particle filtering and one of the things that's important is like you have a Markovian latent state, especially if you have a very long time series, because the memory capacity, if I had like, you know, millions of time points or something huge, eventually I'll run out of memory to store like the latent variable size. So is there a way to sort of automatically, I think you're talking a little bit earlier about auto, like automatically flipping the inference graph to avoid like to, or to know, learn about what conditioning steps you need. Is there also a way to detect sufficient statistics or ways to simplify the computation if say all you're interested in is like where the time series ends up or say like the the log likelihood or something that it doesn't require holding every latent state in memory at once uh yeah so i mean if, if you're after the filtering distribution that's a uh, that's that's um that obviously is a is a marginal of the posterior right uh um <laughs> That's a good question. There's some work that comes out of Sweden, David. Uh, oh, what's his last name? Uh, there's some delayed sampling stuff that actually looks a lot like this. Um, uh, I never, I never remember his name. Um, David. Uh, mm. I can look it up in a, just a second, but the, the short the short answer is uh, um, no. Uh, although that's an interesting general uh, question to ask. In other words, basically, can you de-separate? Yeah. So, uh, as far as I know, nobody has actually said all right if we know so we, we already know how to sort of return you know like we the thing can will the, the problem setup that does say okay we're going to compute the margin we're going to compute the latent distribution over all states including all the all time steps right uh, and then you're saying i want to return the filtering distribution or something like that um 
you're absolutely right that there is an opportunity to use deseparation basically to, to, uh, to manage memory. Uh, I would say again, depends on it, this depends on your, your, your application space and like what you really care about because uh, you're going to kind of screw yourself in the, in the model learning uh, uh, in your model learning capacity if you do this because you need to have the entire computation graph there in order to, to compute gradients basically. But that being said, if you wanted to specialize the time series, there would actually be an interesting probabilistic programming uh, research idea of, of using deseparation for memory management, right? Uh, that's, that's, that's a pretty good idea. And it's totally relevant if what you care about is, the, is only the filtering distribution. Yeah, that's a good idea. More questions? I have I have another question. Go on, yeah, just just like whoever, I, I, everybody should turn their cameras on too, so that I can see what people at the University of Michigan Statistics Department look like. Uh, you know, it's uh, way more interesting to yeah. You know. So it's a little it's a little bit easier. So I'm just curious what you think of the Julia language because you've talked a lot about things that are you know based more in Python, but one of the things about Julia is that it is sort of it solves that two language problem. And it seems like it could be good for probabilistic programming and allow oh, yeah, so there's, I mean, there's two, there's two systems that are very, very well-developed systems. There's Jen in probabilistic from, uh, from the MIT probabilistic computing project project. And there's Turing uh, from Cambridge. And I've worked very closely with both of those, those, those teams. Uh, the, say for instance, the textbook and, and my research is really very language agnostic. I don't really particularly care which language the, the system is in, implemented in. We care much more about the mathematical characteristics of the, the 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 family of models that are denotable by uh, the the languages. So, like, yes, I mean, uh, you know, is is Julia a nice implementation language? One hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, is Python a nice implementation language? No, it's horrible. I hate it actually. Um, but you know, there's a big <laughs> there's a big uh, there's a big infrastructure there and a huge user community. Right. Yeah. Come on, don't let Derek be the only person to end, 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 ask questions, you know. So is there any other questions from students? Yeah, um, great. So um, I would like to thank Frank again for giving a great talk in our seminar. And the recording will be uploaded to our website shortly, so you may check them out later. And thank you all again for joining and look forward to seeing you again next week. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, bye.